Uh, I'm going to be talking to you about something uh, about conformal field theories, and I will focus on two dimensions because two dimensions has a lot of interesting features, and in particular, some sometimes you can solve all the things, which is an amazing thing when it happens. And um, I'm going to be very very basic about it. Okay, so there, we have some ridiculously advanced students here, and uh, I hope they don't get too bored. But it's always good for the ones that know it, it's always good to see things again. It's, it's also always a good thing. So the outline, I'm going to give you an outline. I hope I make it to the end. Okay? I don't make it to the end, I'm going to this class in the coffee group. So today, I hope that I will tell you about the conformal group. Uh, then I will tell you about what happens when you specialize the conformal group to two dimensions. Something rather interesting happens there. So then I'm going to talk about conformal group in 2D. Then I will introduce something that is called the, the Asolo algebra. Okay? And then if we, I mean, then I will tell you about a couple of very important things. I mean, basically the warning. This is going to be basically all the basic story. This is standard material. Okay? This many of you probably know, some of you don't, so do the exercises. We're going to have a lot of exercises in the tutorial. And the new part, I mean the part that many, many of you don't know, is that we're going to learn how to use these tools to compute something called entanglement and for a CFT tool. Okay. We will see that only with three lectures you will be able to compute that, which is quite amazing. This is something that's a very hot subject now, so it's nice. You get very fast to the frontline stuff. Okay. So first of all, let me motivate a bit this uh, why these uh, conformal field theories are important. So conformal field theories are very important because they play a very central role now in this huge landscape that we have for uh, quantum field. So I don't know how many of you have heard about this, but sorry, who has taken QFT here? Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Cool. So uh, the ones that haven't, uh, I'm really sorry, but I'm going to try to give you a very, very broad picture of what these QFTs are. So basically, when you, when I give you a QFT, the idea is that I will give you a Lagrangian. Okay. One thing, one very important thing, I will. You will see that there is an amazing thing about this CFT is that you can get very far without that track, which is a very nice thing. But let's, for the sake of the cartoon, I'm going to tell you. Let's say I give you a Lagrangian, okay? And this Lagrangian will be characterized by a series of coupling constants. These are going to tell you which things interact with each other, okay? So, for example, every every term that you have in your Lagrangian will have a constant in front, okay? These constants, when you start doing so, in classical theory, this is a thing you put by hand. Okay, just put a number, that number will be there forever, fixed. Okay? But when you start doing quantum mechanics, these numbers get corrected. Okay? These numbers start changing when you start scattering particles because of all these interactions that you have. So in the end, these guys, I mean roughly speaking, couplings, is this big enough for the, for the camera? Couplings are functions, become functions of the energy scales. Okay? It depends on how deep you probe a theory. It will, the, the, the strength of the coupling will depend on how deep you probe it. So a very nice way of picturing this is, for example, when you are doing a, a quantum electrodynamics. Okay? When you're doing quantum electrodynamics, you realize that the vacuum has a bunch of pairs that come out of nowhere, right? You've heard about this cartoon, right? That thing can create a screen for the electromagnetic interaction. Okay? You have all these pairs of positive and negative particles that make us screen to the electromagnetic interaction, and that means that the strength which which uh, charged particles interact change with how deep you're probing into the into the theory. Okay? So the basic idea is that you can picture quantum field theories. Don't worry if you don't understand the details of this. Then we will do explanations, more serious stuff. This is just a picture. You can picture quantum field theories as some kind of space of coupling. Yeah? Quantum field theory will be a something in this space and it will be a flow. Okay? in which the coupling constants are changing value, okay? And the parameter 
of this change is going to be the energy scale which you're studying the theory. Okay, is it more or less clear? So there are going to be paths in this space parameterized by mu. Mu is the energy scale. Okay, now it turns out that all this story is due to Wilson and some other people can be, correct, can be written in a very succinct manner in one equation that it's I hope I don't get it wrong. Okay, so logarithmic derivative of this thing equals to something of the type of g. It's equal to one function. So this is just a logarithmic scale. So you can write like mu times the g. Okay? So it's telling you that the change, the gradient flow of this uh, coupling constant is determined by some function called the beta function, but it's something that you can calculate from the field of your study. Okay? Now, if you want to study a flow, this kind. This is the first order flow, right? This in principle has indices, right? I mean, there are like many common concepts. Okay. What would be the first thing you would do if I give you an equation like that? And then you try to figure out what's going on with this equation. If I give you a first order equation, you have first order derivative equals to a function. What's the easiest thing you can do? But solve it. <laughs> that's, that's not the easiest thing. <laughs> If you solve it, right, there is nothing to do. Imagine that you cannot solve it. Imagine that this is very complicated function of g and you know, it's stuff. What do you do? Even simpler than that. You find the fixed point. That's the easiest thing you can do, right? I mean, I give you this equation and I tell you, okay, let's at least find the places where it's stable, right? I mean, let's find the fixed points of this. Not stable, right? When, it's, uh, when this is equal to zero, right? So find the fixed points. The fixed points of this equation are the places where beta is equal to zero. Okay? When the beta function is equal to zero. These are called conformal field figures. Okay? That's why they are important. That's one of the reasons why they are important. Okay? Conformal field theories are the fixed points of this flow. This is called the renormalization group flow. Okay? This story I told you here. RG. Okay, this is just a little, this is one of the reasons they are important, and they are important for a lot of other reasons. But I think this is the most profound and important reason why we are interested in conformal field. Formal field theories are gonna tell you, I'm gonna tell you the, the fixed points of how things change with different energies. Okay? Now, you also know that somehow energies and scales and sizes are inversely proportional, right? I mean, high energies, high energy physics means physics that happens at very small distances, right? You've all heard about. Right? So, what characteristic do these theories have? So, let's say that I start in this map, this landscape of, of coupling constants, and I pick some conformal field theory. Okay? And now I let the clock of energy, which is the clock of distance, right? I mean, this thing, I let it flow. Okay? What's going to happen if I'm standing here in a conformal field theory? Huh? Nothing happens, right? That's why it's called a fixed point, right? So now, the way, a very nice way of constructing quantum field theory is that you can add little things. Yeah? You can add it, a, you can take the Lagrangian that gives you beta equals to zero, and you can add a little perturbation to it, right? And then what's going to happen is that you're going to get out of that thing and flow somewhere, okay? So if you analyze the vicinity of a conformal field theory, you can have things that either, so it's like a landscape, right? You would have things that flow towards the fixed point and things that flow outside of the fixed point. Okay? And now the RG flow will take you somewhere. Sometimes, not always, but these are going to be some of our favorite times, you will end up in another CFD. Okay? This, are, this is a very nice kind of flow. A flow in which is the microscopic description, okay? microscopic in high energies. Okay? In the microscopic description, you have a, Q, uh, a CFD and you flow towards another CFD. Those are very interesting kinds of theories. And they are a large class. Okay? Now, we're not going to study all this flow. It's super complicated. What we're going to study now is what happens when I'm standing at the fixed point. Okay? So at least that you have a picture of what is the thing that we're trying to present. Is it clear more or less the cartoon? Okay, cool. So, one th so let's, see, let's see what these things mean. So let's study something called conformal transformations. I use the word conformal, and I didn't even tell you. Okay, so these conformal transformations, I mean, probably you, if you did some complex analysis, you 
nowhere we're going to land. But these are transformations that preserve angles. Okay? So this is uh, the best way of defining it. They preserve angles between vectors. This looks like by the way. Between vectors. Okay? That's the definition. Can you tell me about some examples of these kinds of transformations that come up to mind? I'm going to start pointing at you for the So for example, I can do a rigid rotation, right? If I, do a, if I have two vectors and I do a rigid rotation, they stay with the same angle between them, right? What else can I do? Translation. Sorry? Translation, yeah, translations. I can do translations. What else can I do? There is one other, yeah, boosts. Excellent. Boosts, yeah, boosts. You know what boosts are, right? These are like rotations with time, right? This is beside this hyperbolic, hyperbolic, but still, and it stays. Another one, there is one more, the extra one. That's what you just described is the Poincare group, right? Poincare group, which is the group of uh, invariances of the special relativity. Scale, that's the extra weird guy, right? Scaling is the new one. And there is going to be another one that is going to show up in space, but at least we know that this group, whatever it is, will have the Poincaré group and scaling. Okay? Sometimes Poincaré group and scaling gives us the full conformal group. Sometimes not, but generally it does. In 2D, it always does. I mean, that's, that's one of the nice things in 2D. In 2D, it's always true. Okay? So notice that scaling is interesting in terms of this picture. So in this picture, I'm at a fixed point, right? And now I let energy flow. I change my energy scale. Changing energy, energy scale is the same as change, it's not the same, of changing length scale, right? System, a system at a certain energy would be like zooming in and zooming out. Notice that these are things that don't change when I zoom in and zoom out. That was how I motivated the thing. So scaling has to be there, right? Has to be theories that have scaling as a signature. Okay? So the way to actually define this, these are going to be transformations that take the metric, okay, and map it. Let me put, well, let me not put a square, but it's going to be a positive. Okay, so take the metric of the system and transform it. Okay, just rescale the metric, okay, by some positive factor. Okay? So every transformation that takes the metric and transforms it into some rescaled. Notice that this depends on the place, right? I mean, local rescaling of the metric. That's going to be a conformal transformation. Remember, well, you're doing all these things with uh, Kevin now, so you must be very good with your, uh, uh, with your differential geometry. So this means this metric that we call it G prime, okay? So what you have is that G prime, let me put indices here, rho sigma x prime equals Mu sigma nu g uh, nu. Okay? So this is how matrix transform, right? So matrix transform like this, and what I'm saying is that with this coefficient has to be some positive function of x. Okay? That's what I'm saying. Alright? So now let's work in, let's say that our initial metric is gonna be just the Minkowski metric, okay? So the Minkowski metric, so we're going to start studying the formal field theories, and we just start in flat space, right? And now G, I'm going to write it as eta, okay? G mu nu, eta mu nu, so I'm in Minkowski space, okay? So let's see that, let's say that I write this equation here, okay? This equation, sorry, this, this relation here with lambda equals 1. What happens if I do lambda equals 1? Then I get that the group of transformations that keep lambda equals 1 is the group that when you do this, 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 you get eta in this side and eta in this side. What is that group called? Sorry? Those are the Poincaré transformations, right? So this is the one that corresponds to Poincaré. Lambda equals 1 gives you the Poincaré. Okay, if, if someone doesn't have this clear, please ask me now, because this is fundamental. It's the first step. step.
step one. Everything else you can forget. This is important. Okay? So it's very important that to understand that these conformal transformations, when the scale is one, gives you the quantity. Now what we're going to try to do is to find restrictions on the possible changes, uh, on the possible transformations, such that this is fulfilled. Okay? So we're going to realize that actually this is a solved problem. So let's consider a change. Consider a map. And the map is going to be, I'm going to take x, and I'm going to map it. It's going to be the same. This is the usual tree, right? Now, okay. We're going to start with an infinitesimal transformation. Okay. We're going to take instead of doing a big transformation, we're just going to change very close to the unity, to, to the identity, right? And this is this is going to allow us to find the kind of transformations that preserve eta equals this thing eta. Okay. And basically, what we will find is the Lie algebra, right? That's that's the usual game. The algebra are these infinitesimal uh, transformations we need to use, right? Okay, so let's write this this equation using that expression over there. So let me do it here so more space. It'd be very nice to be able to use that right? yeah. It's not in the camera. Okay. okay, so let's write this equation. So we'll have Eta, then you be very careful with the signs, so dx dx nu, dx sigma, dx nu, okay? And let's see what happens when this is equal to this. Okay, we write it to first order, okay? And this is just gonna be eta mu nu, right? Apart from the identity, it's gonna give us delta function, right? And then this is gonna be this plus. Alright, so let's start trying to play with this. This is a bit of 
I think, I don't know, the first person that did this actually, I guess, they tried with a lot of different tricks. I'm going to teach you some tricks, and some of them are going to be your tutorial, okay? Some of these tricks to find conditions. So the first thing I want you to notice is that what happens if I just trace both sides with an eta? What do I get on this side if I trace? Trace means contracting the, contracting the indices. Okay, so what you will find is that d mu epsilon mu equals, and let me just, so I take advantage of asking some questions here, and the coefficient in front. What's that coefficient? Mirena. D. D, there is something missing. It's a D, it's right. Where does that D come from? Tracing eta, right? When I trace eta, I pick up a D. There is an extra factor. There's a two, right? I get these two times, right? There's a two. Okay. So this is our this is the first thing. And this is gonna serve us to determine who kappa is. Now we know who's kappa. Kappa in terms of epsilon is just two over d times this uh, uh divergence of the So this is gonna be asterisk one. So keep track of my asterisk the the <laughs> questions. <laughs> okay, they are going to be the ones that we're going to use later. So keep notes because since I don't think we have enough blackboards to keep track of them. So once in a while I will tell you, take asterisk one, plug it here. Okay, so please do keep track of that. So that means that kappa equals, and let's write it like this because it's very nice. Okay? So now we, in principle, we could take this equation and now we know what's on this side, right? Okay? Excellent. So now let's do some shenanigans with this thing, so some little things. So that means, first of all, just let me write one little comment. That means that this lambda that I wrote here, it's equals to 1 plus this thing, right? 2 over d, the epsilon, right? So this is the first constraint we found. This is already an interesting thing. We realized that that lambda and the epsilon are not independent. This is an important hint. OK, so now let's take that equation, first one, and we're going to take the derivative with respect to mu, and then we sum over all mu. OK, we're going to take this one and do that thing. OK, and that's going to give us following. It's going to give us d mu. So I'm going to write it and then we're going to see how it came out. Plus box. We'll tell you what the box means. Okay. It's going to be the first question. So first, we hit with the d mu. Okay, the d mu is going to do this, right? This is going to be the dot. And then I have d mu with d mu. D, sorry, d mu with d mu. That's a box. Okay, the box is just a data version. Okay, oh, so I need a note here for the ones that don't know. D mu, D mu is written as a box. Okay, and then this thing is just a uh, All right, right here. Sorry, I forgot one thing. Uh, there is an extra derivative. Sorry, there is an extra derivative, right? There is this, and there is a derivative that has to be. Okay. Now, what we're going to do is to take another derivative of that. This is something you will redo in the tutorial. Okay, we're going to take another derivative of this equation, and we're going to land in the following equation. We're going to find, and this is first tutorial problem, so I'm going to tell you how it's done, but I'm going to tell you just now. So we're just going to take this equation, hit it with another derivative, and play with the indices, okay? And then you should land in the following very nice equation, which is asterisk 2, okay? Which is d minus 1, okay? Remember that we're in d dimensions, not d plus 1, sorry, this is very important. Okay, and that's the convention of this. d minus 1, that was decided by here, no? <laughs> you decided the convention for me, okay? And box, the epsilon equals to zero. 
That's a very nice compact equation for epsilon, right? So notice that this is just going to come out. I mean, the ingredients are kind of there already, right? So just hit with an extra derivative, because notice that this thing has three derivatives, right? So you have to cook up a thing with three derivatives such that you manage to find this thing, okay? So we're going to do this in the afternoon. Mainly because I realize I don't have time to get my lecture. Okay? Now, there is an extra question on level. So now, for a second, let's focus on the larger or equal to the Okay? So I told you my interest is uh, two dimensions. But let's see what happens in, in bigger, in big dimensions. Okay? So, is there any conclusion you can take from that question I just wrote? Any fast conclusion you can take from this? What does this tell you about what happens? What does that tell you about this guy? What form can it take? Can it take any form? It must be linear. Exactly, it must be linear, right? Everybody sees it, right? Because the derivative, I mean, this is, this is a double derivative, right? And then if it's zero, it means that it's mostly linear, yeah, right? So that means this is uh, going to be, uh, let me write like this, let me write one. It's going to be some a nu, this is a constant, okay? Plus some, uh, let's call it capital B nu, x uh, This is a scalar, right? I mean, this is a scalar, so I did something to <laughs> I jump one second. Just a constant, right? It's a constant A plus some linear A combination. Okay? Now let's integrate this thing, right? I mean, let's try to find, let's integrate. Let's try to find what is epsilon out of this. Okay? So we make an ansatz, and then we're going to test our ansatz and find the form of the different coefficients. Okay? So now, that means, and this is our ansatz, that we, I can tell you that works, it kind of makes it boring for an ansatz, it will work. The answer is that our transformation has the form, let's give names to this, V mu nu x nu plus c nu, uh, so, no, so, so if I want a mu here, New row, and that's x new, x new. Okay? It's some quadratic thing. Okay? So this is just, these are just sets of coefficients. Does everybody agree that this satisfies this equation? This, sorry, this equation? It's clear, right? I mean, just hit it with the derivatives, you will see that it works. Okay? Now, all these things are infinitesimal. Okay? This is an important thing to keep in mind. So, that a nu, b nu nu, c nu nu nu. So this means that hereafter, every time you have a square of one of these things, you take it out. It's beyond our uh, approximation uh, cut. Okay. Now let's try to see what these a's and b's and stuff are. Let's try to constrain it, constrain them as much as possible. Yeah. Well, that's the exercise for the tutorial. It's d minus one. It's correct. Okay. You will find it. You will find it. But keep track. Of it. If I make a mistake, let me know. But this is it's a d minus one. Okay. Now let's try to study all these transformations. Okay. And see what happens. So let's just consider for a second. We can treat them separately. And uh, let's consider just what happens if I consider just a nu. Okay? So that means that I'm considering which transformation. It's a transformation where only this guy is present. Okay? How are these transformations called? I mean immediately before you even solving it. So that means that I'm taking x nu and I'm mapping it to x nu plus a nu, where a nu is a constant. It's a translation, right? So that means that this guy is just a translation. And you can actually, yeah, I mean, this is quite obvious, right? I think this is obvious for everything. Now I'm going to write the generators. Yeah. So uh, does anybody remember what's the name of the generator of the translation? It's 
momentum, right? Momentum is the guy that generates this. So, generator. So, I'm going to write each of them, and then I'm going to write all the generators, okay? I mean, the objective is to find the alpha. And how does this generator work? Then we fix the eyes and all that stuff, but it's what? It's just that they need right? Okay? So, this is the mean. First generator of our algebra. It's a good consistency check. We were expected to get the translation, right? <coughs> Great. Now let's see what happens with B. So now you take that B, right? And now you're gonna plug it into using this guy. You have to use this guy. You're gonna plug it into the equation, sorry, I erased it. It's uh, the one that has the new, new equals that thing. Okay? I'm going to plug it in this one. That should be one, actually. I'm sorry. It's one is this one. Okay? So you plug it in this one, we're getting something like this thing. And that's something you can check on your own. I'll write the answer, and then we're just going to, I'm going to tell you how you get it. You will find that for me, find a very nice constraint. You find the constraint that b mu nu plus b mu nu two times the symmetric part, right? Two times the symmetric part equals our famous 2 over d, okay? Eta goes sigma b mu times eta mu nu, okay? This is super easy to find, right? I mean, I hit the thing with the derivative, right? In the d mu epsilon u, I mean, just hit it with the derivative, that kills this guy, right? So first it will kill one contracted here, then it will kill one contracted here, so we get this symmetric part, right? And then we have this side that just comes from the distance. Okay? That's, that should be very easy to check. So this is telling you, telling you something very nice. This is telling you something about the symmetric part of this tensor, the form of the symmetric part of this tensor. What is it telling you? I mean, it looks messy, but it's a very, there is a very nice statement there. It's telling you that the symmetric part is proportional to the Minkowski method. Could have been any, right? I mean, there is no reason every symmetric tensor should be proportional to Minkowski. I mean, in the end, this is just a, this is just a number, right? Okay? So, that means that if we decompose the mu nu to some symmetric, some anti-symmetric part. You can always do this sort of anti symmetric part. Okay? You find that the symmetric part can be written as some constant, let's call it alpha, eta mu nu, okay? plus some anti-symmetric part that let me call it m mu nu. Okay? Symmetric. Okay? Now Let's for a moment forget about alpha. Why is the transformation epsilon goes to anti-symmetric thing times, sorry, yeah, yeah, sorry, x goes to x plus anti-symmetric matrix times x? That one is also famous. Come on, don't be afraid. The rotations and boosts, right? This is generating to you the rotations and the boosts. So this is great. We're, that means we're really in good track. Okay? We're finding everything that we should find. Okay, so that means that M mu mu generates rotations and boosts, which are also kind of rotation. Right? It's a rotation in a hyperbolic space, right? Boosts are just that. Okay? Now what happens, first question, what happens if, remember that this thing is related to kappa, right? What would have happened if kappa were zero? Would this term be here or not? Remember, kappa is the delta equals one plus, plus kappa. What happens if kappa is not there? Take it home, you think? This term wouldn't be there, okay? There, there would be nothing in the other side of the equation, right? Just not. So it means that we would be kind of done. I mean, kind of. We would have already 
the translations and the Lorentz part. Okay? But we are saying that kappa is non zero. Okay? So kappa is non zero, so let's see what these guys are. So what is this thing? What are these kind of transformations? I mean what are they doing, these guys? I mean, it looks a lot like a translation. Right? It's a translation with a new type. So it's not hard to realize, and I'll tell you how to realize, that these guys are just scaling. Okay? These are just scaling. So we have all the obvious ones already, right? We have a group that has all the Poincare group plus scalars. So that's how far we've gotten. I mean, still C is there. C is the weird guy. Okay? Up until now, we're really, really fine. And let's write the generators, because we're in this policy of writing generators. So, L mu nu, okay? It's the, the generators finding our momentum are just given by i, x, nu, d nu, minus x nu, d nu, right? These are the other generators, okay? And now, the generators of scalings, I will write them with a b, okay, and they are going to be minus i x mu. Okay. So, yeah, we're that far in our algebra. Okay. Now, let's go to the last guy. The last guy needs some little extra information, okay? Some little extra information that will also come from the basic equation d mu f sub mu plus d mu epsilon mu equals to this key. Everything comes from there. This is conformal key in equation, as I named this thing. Okay. Now, from that equation, and that we'll do also again in the tutorial, we will play with the derivatives and rotating indices and stuff, and you will find a very nice condition, very nice conditions for C. Okay? So I'm going to write just the nice conditions for C. And uh, maybe I realize that the name I gave to this thing is not very good. Okay, I'll, it doesn't matter. I'll, I'll explain why. Right. This is the other tutorial exercise that we're going to do. Exercise number two. You have to find that this guy, the C, generates the following kind of transformation. Okay, so this means I'm writing it already sum all, right? So it's going to be the x mu plus. And then we write this, this and I never managed to learn more. So like this. X dot delta, X mu, minus, I will tell you what beta is. Where beta is just a vector, it's just a constant. Okay. okay. I will tell you how, how, we will do it in the tutorial together, okay? So basically, let me tell you how the steps go. So now you take, this guy, just with the C turned on, you plug it again into the same equation, and now you have to do some tricks with the derivative. And you will find that the C can be separated using a single constant. It's very nice. It's a, it's, looks like it has three indices. Well, it has three indices, right? But you will find that the full set of Cs is depends only on one single vector. Okay? And that vector, these transformations are called special and formal. Transformation. This guy's close the group. Okay? And the generators of these guys are minus i. So notice that this is really the weird guy. And this is the weird cousin. And uh, It's clear this is contracted with this one, right? Then this derivative and then this one. Okay. These are the full set of generators. Okay, is it at least clear how the procedure goes? I mean, this is just basically telling us what C is. So 
So let me just outline the procedure. Okay? Full procedure to find the adjunct. I told you first that I have some transformations that map the metric into some metric that is just the same metric times a factor, times a positive guy. Okay? Now what I do is that I say, well, let's say that my transformation is infinitesimal, okay? And I plot that in both sides. And that gives me an equation. That equation is this conformal Cleveland equation. It tells you that d mu epsilon nu plus d mu epsilon nu equals some uh, eta times some constant function. That don't say, sorry, a positive function. It's a, it's a function. It's, it depends on this. Okay? Then you play with these things and try to find a constraint on epsilon. And then you find that the epsilon is really, really constrained. And it's constrained to generate translations, scalings, uh, what are they? Well, uh, sorry, translation, scalings, uh, boosts and rotations, and these extra strange guys. Okay? Now, these extra strange guys, I'm not going to talk too much about them, but I can tell you that they can be generated in a relatively simple way using, uh, using translations and something called uh, perturbations. Okay? <coughs> What's inversion? Sorry, perturbation. Inversion. So you're going to invert in a circle and then you can do some tricks. Okay? So they are not as weird as they seem, but they are weird. Okay, so now let's go back here. This is conformal algebra. What time is it? I started the exam. Excellent. Okay. Great, I'm going to make it where I want. Okay, so let's write the full conformal algebra. It's going to be generated by a distance. Let's keep it here because it's going to need it. algebra is actually a very cool algebra. I mean, you can actually rewrite it in such a way that it will show you something that teaches you a lot more. Okay? So, the homework slash tutorial, of course I will tell you how to do it. It's not that I'm throwing it directly to the water. The homework slash tutorial is to show another alternative form of this algebra, in which it will become something really familiar. Okay? Because as it is, I mean, in principle, we just have to start calculating commutators and see how they relate to each other. That's what you do with an algebra, right? And that's a bit of a mess. I'm going to tell you a way of rewriting these generators in such a way that you will see something very familiar. Okay? So, homework slash tutorial. This means that many will not manage to finish it in the tutorial, but you have to finish it at home, right? Maybe it should be the Okay. And this is to show that the conformal algebra it's actually isomorphic. You can write it down as S O D. Now 
what is SOD comma 2, which is very fast. So, can anybody tell me what was, just a question, what was SOD comma 1? It's a set of cross groups that preserve the meta Exactly. It's called the Lorentz group. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah, it's the one that preserves a metric. I mean, I have my own, I, I use the following signature. Preserves things that have minus, plus, 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 right? The set of transformations that preserve this metric, right? It's the Lorentz group, right? And it's not such a weird thing. Now, obviously, so I don't think I will use the green anymore. But now, what do you think it's SO D comma R? R is an integer. I mean, just by induction. It's going to preserve what? It's going to preserve a metric that has R minus sign and D plus and D plus. This is what I mean when I write that. But I'm telling you something that actually is very nice. It's telling you that this messy algebra that we wrote here. Very messy algebra. It's just the algebra that preserves this metric, a metric with two minus signs, and uh, the rest plus signs, in one dimension more. Right? I mean, before we were. Uh, actually, I'm sorry. <laughs> so, I think one dimension more, right? <laughs> no, no, no. It's, 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 it's my, my, my bad. No. Okay? So, you see that? You understand what I'm saying? This is quite remarkable, right? I mean, you start with an algebra that tells you something about space and transformation, let's say three time and one, three space and one time, okay? It's telling you, look, you could see this as a group of transformations in a thing with one extra dimension. Just another way of rewriting. There is no magic here. Uh, Laura, that's for a space time with one time and d minus space dimensions. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, sorry. So, remember, so, remember, my convention, is D. So, sorry, this means that, yeah. So, this means that these are D minus one. Okay? So, I'm using D for space and time. Okay? It's, that's because of the, because we put a D minus two before. It's just that. Okay? Just to be consistent. Okay? Every, everybody was clear, uh, understood that remark. Very important. I mean, it's just a convention, but it's important to know. Okay? The minus comes with the time. Okay, so here is one time, so there is one minus already. So now we have two minus. Now, I think that it's really good, I don't know if someone will talk to you about this in the course of these lectures, is that that group is the isolated group of a very nice manifold called anti sitter space. Okay? So this is at the root of something that you will hear all the time, and probably understand very little sometimes, something called ADS-CFT. This is like the first thing that tells you that there is a relationship between CFTs in D dimensions and until the sitter spaces in D plus one dimensions. Okay? We will hear about well, okay. We're not going to do anything about that. So that you, you know what's at the root of ADS equals CFT. Okay? Now, how do you get to show that? So this is the hint. So by telling you the hint, I'm basically telling you the hard part, and then you have to sit down and just work. Okay? Just commutate it. You have to do it once in your life. Just commutators and commutators. And it's, it's quite horrible, but uh, it's good for, you. good for you. Okay? So the trick is that, of course, if you just take this algebra as it is, you will not see it. You have to combine it in a clever way. So these are the combinations. We're going to write some GM, then we call it GMN. Now the indices M and N run to until run until, uh, sorry, t plus 1, okay? Okay, so m and n are going to run into d plus 1, but I'm going to write these indices in a slightly different way, but it's just a convention. I'm going to say that this goes from minus 1, 0, until d minus 1. It's just a way of writing that, okay? Now, these generators are going to be some matrices in which I'm going to pack all these guys. Okay? So we're going to write it and then we're going to try to see how the matrix looks like more or less. Okay? So they are going to be defined such that G mu nu is just N mu nu. Okay? Where mu nu, this is a zero, I hope it's coming. 
where mu and u are this last one. Okay? Jimmy Nu is L mu nu, then I'm gonna put in the minus one component, which has no deep meaning, just one component of the matrix, it's not the deep of the minus. Here I'm gonna put this combination of momentum, okay? These are the vector like generators, right? I'm gonna combine them in this way, and then I'm gonna put in the zero, comma mu, I'm gonna put the positive one. Okay? And in the minus one, comma zero, I'm gonna put just D. Okay? So this will generate all these full G M mu. Okay? G M M. So let's try to see if we, I haven't done this, but let's try to see if we can write like a huge matrix and see where they go. Does anybody, can, can anybody tell me what's uh, M new zero? Because I didn't say what's new zero, right? What is it? Make a guess. Here is our usual space time, right? Sorry. It's going to be this box. It's going to be our usual space time. Okay? So this is the part that has the mu new kind of stuff. Okay? So mu new, this is just going to be this guy. Now, here I have two extra guys, right? And then here, two extra. Two extra columns here, right? And then I have some extra thing here. Okay? These are the guys that are non-trivial, right? Because why why didn't I put this one? Sorry. Can anybody tell? Me? Why am I not putting this one? Come on, it's crazy. Or this one. Why am I not saying anything about this two? Because they're yeah, because they're zero, but say it. They are zero, right? I mean, that's one. So this one is off-diagonal, right? So this is the minus one part, and this is the zero part, and this is, say, the mu part. Okay? This is how I'm building my super matrix. Okay? Now here, in the zero mu, I'm putting this one, right? Here I'm putting half p mu, k mu. In this one, that has the minus one, I'm putting the same thing with the minus, right? And here, I'm just putting the mu. So there is nothing mystical about putting minus one and zero. All I'm saying is that I'm taking these generators, building these big matrices, in which I put them in this one. Is it clear to everybody? Just clean an out. No mysteries. Okay. Now, what you have to show, and this one's Maybe one day we learn in my class. You have to show that you commute these guys, you get this thing.
given that I have five minutes, maybe, uh, I will just tell you why B equals to two is so special. Why why do we care about the equals to two? Okay, so this is true. This is a general thing. Now B equals to two, something magical happens to this uh, algorithm. Okay. And uh, now let me go to Euclidean signature for a second, just just for now. Then I will make some comments about right. By Euclidean, I mean that I'm going to put the time to one in the plus. There is there are no no big problem. Okay. So keep an keep a note. Put it on the note. Otherwise, you're going to switch to Euclidean. Now, in two dimensions, since this is a small dimension, we can write our conformal keying equation in two Okay? So we're going to write the epsilon. Epsilon now has only two, two components. So let me write it like epsilon 0, epsilon 1. Let me go up and down a lot easier, right? Okay? So now let's try to write the conformal keying equation. So, what was the conformal keying equation? It was this one, right? Proportional to vitamin. That's that's the message, right? Vitamin U, which now is identical. So let's try to write this equation. Okay. So let's write first the diagonal. Okay? The diagonal. So this is a matrix equation, right? So the diagonal terms are going to be equal to one, right? So we're going to find that two. B0, epsilon 0, which is, I'm sorry, <laughs> x equals to B0, epsilon 1. Where did I get this side? I didn't write on the little bit for me to see what we So we knew that we, uh, this is just very uh, zero to 0. equal to the identity times what? So this is the zero zero component, right? This you all see. Left hand side, clear to everybody, right? Zero, 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 zero. That's two. Okay? That has to be proportional to something with a one. And what was that proportionality? It was two over d d f. D is two, two over two. Okay. And this is okay. So this is the diagonal part. Is that thing? And the other one, how does it look like? The other, there are two diagonal parts. Very easy, right? Just x one equals to c. These are the diagonal, the diagonal condition. Now, of diagonal. Give me the one zero component. You. Exactly. One. Zero. Exactly. No, no, no. The opposite, right? So now it's new and you have changed, so it's zero, epsilon one. And this is equal to what? Zero. Zero, exactly. Excellent. Does anybody recognize these equations already? They are two of the most famous equations ever. It looks very silly that we already got them. Cauchy-Riemann. Cauchy-Riemann, yeah. So these are just the Cauchy-Riemann equations, right? Does everybody remember what Cauchy-Riemann equations are? They are basically the equations that tell you whether a function is homomorphic or not. Okay? So that's the great news. Conformal transformations. And we're going to write these. We're going to start from there in the next lecture. Conformal transformations in two dimensions are homomorphic maps. Okay? Which is something, you, if you did complex analysis, you probably in the first place you heard conformal transformation was for homomorphic, so maybe it's not a surprise. But it is very nice. Now we have all the richness of uh, complex analysis. Now it became our tool. Okay? So let's start, uh, let's see you tomorrow, or later for tomorrow.